Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at the arrival of Europeans to the Americas and the beginning of 1301, the start of American history by and large. The first people who came to this landmass came here uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, the natives were a diverse group, lots of different languages, lots of different societies, lots of different cultures. Over the course of this lecture, as we discuss Native Americans, they're going to be viewed as different uh, terms too: uh, Native peoples, first peoples, founding peoples, Native Americans, Indians. They are just the different terms that are used for them. These people came to the Americas on the Bering Strait. Uh, during the last great ice age, 20,000 years ago, the sea in the North Pacific between Russia and Alaska was frozen. These people migrated across that frozen expanse. And then when that last great ice age ended, and mind you, it took a generation for that to happen, the ice bridge was gone. So if you were on this landmass at that point, congratulations, this is home now. And if you were in Asia, well, that is home also. And at that point forward, some people chose to remain in the north and some people chose to migrate into other parts of the Americas, north and south. Agriculture predominantly is based along the three sisters corn, squash, and beans. They're referred to as the three sisters because these three vegetable crops typically are planted together and they give and receive the nutrients that each of the other plants need, making them collectively much stronger when they're planted together. There's a very um, popular Native American dish, uh, three sisters soup, which is the collection of corn and squash and beans. You turn it into a soup. It's rather hearty, a good vegetable soup, but it was also very popular for the obvious reasons. In the Americas, we see that there's a lot of different groups. You've got the Aztecs that are going to dominate and create an empire in modern day Mexico with a city that would rival a lot of others at the time called Tenochtitlan. The Incas were going to exist in Machu Picchu in modern day Brazil or Peru. And these native peoples did not have advanced weapons, no metals, no tools, no tech by and large at all. And the Europeans who arrive are going to view the fact that those native peoples do not have these resources as a justification to conquer said peoples. In the Continental United States, you've got the mound builders of the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, they created these giant earthen mounds that became their cities. They would trade across large parts of North America. Uh, one of the big ones would be Cahoyca, which was located in modern day St. Louis. In the American Southwest, we've got the Pueblos of the Anasazi, and for them, they created canals and irrigation systems that worked with the fact that you know you're in a desert to keep the livestock and agriculture going the spanish are going to be the ones who give the name pueblos to these buildings and these structures were in the sides of cliffs and overhangs and caves and they really allowed for people to live in a very harsh climate very comfortably and then we've got the Great Plains groups, hunters across this vast central part of the Americas, specifically North America, hunter gatherers who did what they did, lacking traditional resources to survive and become great peoples. On the Eastern coast, we've got a mix of agriculture, hunting, sea foresting and sea foraging groups we've got the five Iroquois tribes who created at one point the Great League of Peace, five different tribes that came together to create a nation, the likes of which we could compare to anywhere else in the world at this time. 
it was really diverse ultimately all across north america native society didn't have one mold it fit into and that is really by and large where we see a lot of the peoples who are here you can't just say all natives blank all first persons blank because they are so very diverse here we've got some pictures of these different groups uh, we've got the mound builders and the pictures in the top right and uh, bottom right and then we've got the anasazi in the uh, bottom left and the hoping the pueblos that we see more indicative there native american religion had this idea uh well a lot of ideas but one of the principal ones was animism the idea that the animal had a spirit that could watch over you that could protect you who could act as your guide and this could be a god it could just be the animal itself but the nature and the spirit were one and the same for the tribal groups the shaman the medicine man was the connection to the divine he would be the equivalent to a priest in in christianity this was your connection to it sometimes they had understandings of climate and weather enough to say it's time to move it's time to go and sometimes when it wasn't it is the will of the spirits Europeans who come to the Americas who view these characteristics of Native American religion view this as so foreign that they justify this as a reason that we need to conquer and convert these people to our faith to Christianity Native people viewed the land as a common thing uh, Europeans view land as this is your thing and this might be one of the biggest conceptual differences between these two groups for native people they believed that the land belongs to all and that a gift from the land from a person could really be instrumental for example a gift of food from the land was paramount a gift of clothing from the land knitted clothes uh, hide vest this in some cases is tantamount to saving a life we see that for native people they are there's some groups that are matrilineal where family and status and last name follows mom and not dad which did not exist at all in europe and in native societies we see that native women can own things they can own their tools they can own their homes they can own the they can own whatever they need to own but in europe like england for example if you're married you as a woman you are not a independent person you are the property of your husband you're almost a slave <laughs> europeans who come here they viewed the no the um, native americans in a lot of ways sometimes it was uncivilized or as a noble savage and over time this image gets significantly worse becoming more barbaric and the idea that the native people did not use the land meant that the british the french the dutch could claim it since you know that meant for them it's up for grabs and no one quote unquote lives here ultimately the fact that property equated to political power in a lot of different ways in europe this was one of the things that's going to lead to justifications to conquer um a lot of these european forces who arrive in the americas in the late 15th and throughout the 16th century view the differences between europeans and native peoples as so divergent that it justifies we need to conquer them we need to help them we need to free them for native peoples they didn't have a european style government so for europeans didn't view they had a government when europeaners tried to enslave 
Native people, as you can imagine, Native people would run away and resist. And that was the benefit of living there for so long. They knew where to go. They knew how to fight back. The technology hurt. The technology hurt. Uh, the fact that you have a gun versus you have a bow and arrow. Yes, the gun is more devastating. The bow and arrow, though, has the luxury of being much quicker to reload. Those old black powder muskets can get a round off every about a minute, but that bow and arrow can be reloaded six times in that period. For Europeaners, the belief in Christianity was tantamount. By this point, Western Europe had gone through a real push that the only faith is Christianity. Practicing anything else was heresy, and you could be killed for that. You could be horribly, brutally tortured for believing anything else. And that persecution was really terrible. European kings believed that they were allowed to view because Christian God allowed them to view, rule. This is the divine right of kings, and that's uh, Louis the Fourteenth, King of France, who believed himself ordained by Big G God to rule. This idea that he is in charge is kind of continuing for a while more. Um, in Western European cultures, it is absolute, absolutely patriarchal. The man has total authority of the family. Uh, women, once they marry, they lose all their rights, they lose all their legal identity, and anything that they owned was not theirs anymore. In this part of the world, in Western Europe, you needed land to vote. You needed land to participate in politics. Without land, you have no say in your government. So viewing the Americas as nobody was using the land, it was an easier justification and an easier, wow, I'm going to take that land. If you were poor and a small farmer barely etching out a, your life on a leased property, the idea of, wow, there's all that free land in the Americas, that might be very enticing to you. Now, exploration really gets started prior to this in the 15th century. And our first big explorer is a Chinese guy. His name is Zhong Ha. He was a seven foot tall Muslim eunuch who controlled 25,000 sailors across 62 ships. Uh, they explored all across the Indian Ocean, even reaching Asia. They, they were doing a lot. And the goal of Zheng Ha was to show off how strong China had advanced. They developed new forms of technology, compass, the uh, coordinate sailing, so you knew right where you're at, caravel ships, so you could sail into the wind. Then you've got the Portuguese who show up, and they start trading in West Africa. And the goal for them was to get to the Indian Ocean. The... Ottoman Turks had closed land trade to Asia. The Portuguese want to still get into the Indian Ocean to get rich in trading. So they want to go south, follow Africa around, and then boom, you're in the Indian Ocean eventually. They created these trading posts around Africa on the west side and start dealing with the slave traders and exporting people. Now, Africa had slaves way before Europeaners showed up. Uh, the slaves that were in Africa, you could be enslaved for being a criminal, for losing a war, for having a lot of debt. This was not uncommon. What became worse was the fact that how many people are going to be displaced and how quickly they are displaced. We see that between 1450 and 1500, over 100,000 slaves will be taken out of Africa and then go to somewhere on the Iberian Peninsula. The Iberian Peninsula would be Spain and Portugal. By 1502, the first slaves are taken to the Caribbean island and start working plantation colonies there because 
the resources there, the crops that you could grow there demand a lot of attention, demand a lot of work, and you can have tons of profit farming sugarcane or tobacco or rice or indigo, and you can have even more if you don't pay your people. When Columbus finally gets his expedition in 1492, he didn't think the world was flat. He just thought it was a lot smaller than it was. He believed that if he sailed west, eventually he was going to land somewhere in East Asia. He sailed west. Unfortunately, the world was a third larger than he thought it was, and he lands in the Americas. And with his return, came the desire to increase trade. The thought that, wow, we could get to Asia that quickly, so why not? Let's increase trade with Asia by heading west and then arriving east. We'll spread Christianity as we go. And here we see the depiction of Columbus's landfall. In the foreground, in the front left, you can see King Ferdinand of Spain, who financed this voyage. You can see the three ships that Columbus took with him, and Columbus is in this ship that is landing, and you can see the native people who are assembled there. Columbus lands in the Bahamas at an area called Hispaniola, which would become the epicenter of the new Spanish empire. Spain wanted very quickly to grow an empire in the Americas, not even realizing it was the Americas at this point. They wanted to expand, spread their faith, get rich and make names for themselves. And this led to groups of people who were really good at doing that in really harsh and horrible ways, conquistadors. Um, Hernan Cortes is depicted here in, the, in that armor. He was, well, he chose to defeat the Aztecs. Uh, he went to Cuba, he was governor of Cuba for a while, and then he leads an army to take out the Aztec Empire. And he was extremely successful in doing this. His weapons were very powerful, but the weapon that was most dangerous was the invisible one, smallpox. Smallpox had never been in the Americas until this point. So Cortez's men bringing this disease to the natives very, very, very quickly led to the collapse of these empires. Pizarro went to Peru, conquered the Incas in about the same way. He did some extraordinarily cruel techniques as well. Um, Cortez was believed by the Aztecs to be a reincarnation of one of their gods. Uh, Pizarro used his faith to justify strangling a lot of people. This, these people achieved a lot of things, but by no means were these good guys. And larger than the diseases that were given to the Native Americans is all the other stuff that comes out of the Americas. Foods, uh, tomatoes, potatoes, yams, cassava, all those foods that we have were on the Americas first. And Europeaners, old worlders, had no access to this food stuff. So it starts arriving in the old world and it becomes the staple for so many people. I think Italian food prior to the tomato. If you think Irish food, you're probably thinking something with potatoes. Again, prior to the 16th century, that was not a possible thing. Horses go to the Americas. Horses were all extinct on this landmass. Pigs also come to the Americas. They were they had never been here before and they they really spread real fast. The way that the uh, Aztecs were ultimately defeated, Cortes had known that the Aztecs made a lot of em enemies in conquering each other. And even though he was outnumbered, well, he, Cortes and his men were 400 people against an empire of about 4 million people, 
Cortes was able to win predominantly by getting the Aztec enemies to fight them. So you have native groups fighting native groups, and in the end, you know, they all died anyways. Spain wanted to get rich by acquiring lots of gold, lots of silver. That was the goal of it. And it was present. It was very, very present. The emperor, the Aztec Empire, Moctezuma II, he was, some say, the richest man in the Americas prior to the mid-16th century. The goal for silver, though, was so extreme because there was a silver mountain in Latin America called Potosi, and the goal of extracting wealth from it was, well, it's a mountain made of silver. It's pretty obvious you would want to get a lot of that money. The control of the Spanish Empire in the Americas would fall first to the king to pick people and then the Catholic Church for running things. So if you were a person of note, you were more likely to control these colonies in Latin America. If you were a native person, you were, it's not going to go well for you. Um, you might die from smallpox. You might die because an enemy tribe has finally decided to fight you. You might die because you have been enslaved. You might, there's a lot of bad things, but uh, harvesting the gold, harvesting the silver was one of the big ways bad things happened. A lot of the people who came here are going to be men. They're going to marry native persons and their offspring are going to be known as mestizos, mixed kids. Um, these mixed children usually though were seen as below socially both mom and dad. So it was not a good upraising for them. Spain hoped that over time the native peoples would just join Spanish society, despite the fact that they had been treated so poorly for so long. That never really happened. Spanish culture and Spanish America kind of was a combination of native peoples stuff, uh, old worlders, Spanish stuff, and even the African culture from the slaves it kind of mixed together to create what we now see. There's the history that was taught, and then there was the history that was real. Um, the Spanish like to depict themselves in the upper left picture. You know, they're building churches, they're praising their God, they're, everything is good and nice, and then you see the reality, which is the bottom right, and it is a massacre, it is horrible, it is terrible. The justification for conquering these people is that the natives were expect they're going to adopt our way of doing things. And if they don't, then they're heathens, they're savages, and they are enemies of our God. So we can kill them. There is a big push early on from a lot of different Western powers to conquer as much of this land as they can. And it took the Pope getting involved to decide who gets what. The two big colonizers of the Americas initially is going to be the nation of Spain and the nation of Portugal. The Pope took a map of the world and when it looked like war was going to happen between Spain and Portugal over who gets control of what parts of the Americas, he took a map of the world and just drew a line down it and said, okay, everything east of this line belongs to the Portuguese and everything west of this line belongs to Spain. This would become known as the Treaty of Tordesillas and was supposed to fix things. But again, it didn't because, well, that was drawn in 1494 and they were still not aware that this was an entire landmass, not just, hey, there's a little chunk of East Asia we can get to. Bartolomé de la Casa was a Spanish priest, and he wrote this diatribe, a very brief account of the destructiveness of the Indies, and that's him there. 
he said that, you know, this is terrible how the native peoples are being treated. This is horrible. We need to treat these people better. He said that they are not savages. They are rational people. They are rational beings. They are like us. They just never heard our faith. And he tried for a long time, for most of his life, to make things better for Native Americans and get conditions better. And he helped a little bit, but unfortunately not a lot. Um, by 1542, new laws, predominantly because of the work of De La Casa, said that Native Americans could no longer be enslaved and the encomienda system was you know, gone. There is a video, it's not me, it's someone else, that is going to be put up next to this one. I would highly encourage you check it out because it talks about the encomienda system. It is basically feudalism in Latin America, but it's gone. As we've already mentioned, there is the idea that the the Spanish depicted themselves as one way versus the reality of how they were portrayed. More exploration of North America would continue. In the early 16th century, Ponce de Leon explored Florida for Spain, and he elusively found the fountain of life there, the fountain of youth. Some of these expeditions would attack native societies. Some of them were just, hey, what's over there? Um, these explorations really are kind of all over the place. Spain wanted to establish a military base in Florida as soon as it was realized, wow, Florida is kind of big and wow, Florida is not an island, so it would be good to have a launching place here. And they established St. Augustine. It is the oldest inhabited site in the United States where Europeaners stayed for, for you know, any ever amount of time. They spread Christianity through here. And in the Southwest, we've got Juan de Onat. He was a conquistador who chose to attack native peoples in the Southwest, uh, where you can see here, this part of New Mexico. However, the Spanish priests who would go to this region wanted to completely remove Native American religious practices and because they said these practices are not what our faith is all about they're inconsistent with us and what we believe so we want to do away with them that was as you can imagine tremendously unpopular uh, the pueblo people revolted against this killed a couple hundred people and for the next 12 years the spanish were not able to have a presence in this region at all ultimately in 1692 the spanish were able to recapture this region and from that point on, they were willing to be a lot more tolerant of what the native people were doing. The French and the Dutch, and this map here kind of shows where we're talking about when we're discussing where the French and the Dutch were going to start colonizing, focus really more on the idea of trading with Native Americans and trading for resources than having lots of people stay and live here. The thing that they wanted to trade predominantly was fur. It was called soft gold. Beaver pelt was a luxury item, and it's kind of easy to you know, take down a beaver, especially if you're armed. One of our early explorers and founders for New France is going to be Samuel de Champlain. He founds Quebec in 1608. There really wasn't an assembly of people. There was no political institution here. Most of the people who show up here are men. And again, they focus on trade and friendly relations with Native Americans. The French understood they were the minority in this region and wanted to, well, A, make money and B, not die from Native Americans. They were given a lot more autonomy to function however they wanted to. And children from the French and the native people were called uh, Metis. And unfortunately, they were treated about the same as the Mestizos were in Spain and New Spain, uh, not well. Our big explorer for the Dutch is a man named Henry Hudson. He explored New York for the Dutch East India Company, a trading exploration company that was more powerful than a couple of other nations 
and to finance these explorations, the Dutch invented the idea of a joint stock company, which is, well, it's like any stock, it's like any publicly traded company now. But the Dutch, they believed in a lot of great freedoms, freedom of press, freedom to worship, however you wanted. And that was going to carry through to the New Netherlands, to the areas that the Dutch are going to conquer slash colonize. But they also dominated the Atlantic slave trade. So please don't think that they're all great and wonderful. Dutch women did have legal identities when they got married. And the Dutch said, you can worship whatever religion you want to in private, but in public, you're, you're just not going to worship whatever you want to. The Dutch wanted people to come here. They knew that this incentive, that if they could incentivize people to come here, people are going to come here, stay here, and the Dutch would have a greater presence in the region. And they offered, if you want to come here, you can have free land. All you have to do is stay here for six years. And lots of people who came here didn't settle where the Dutch wanted them to because the Dutch took the northern areas. These are areas that are colder, that are wetter. And if you're going to settle here, yes, you've got land and that's great, but you have no voice and all your family and background and, and your, everything is back on the other side of the Atlantic. As with the French, the Dutch wanted to trade with Native Americans, did not necessarily conquer them. And settlement in these territories was kind of on the idea of purchasing the land from the natives. Uh, not always was these deals fair, not always were they equitable, but that was the basic premise of it. There's a lot of commonalities that we see between what the French did, what the Spanish did, and what the Dutch do. So think about what we've got here. We have Europeaners who want to come here, who want to explore. We have desires to get rich quick, desires to expand your nation, desire to make a name for yourself. It's how you did all these things. So today we took a look at the early American history, the quote unquote discovery of the Americas. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.